som var en kanske gumma som benyb det stäcka men vi ska ta den idag när vi ska gå hit i mer kommer fall kvar och nog för in i bok vi här att GM Fredrik Fuxos gör sin tjänar jobbet fatt Hello and welcome along to the Life Changing Moments podcast series on the 42. I'm Fintan O'Toole and today we're back again to chat with our latest guest in the series, Cork Ladies All-Ireland winning footballer Breed Stack. Now we've teamed up with UPMC, the official healthcare partner of the GPA and GAA to produce this Life Changing Moments podcast series. With over 40 hospitals, 700 doctors and 90,000 employees globally, UPMC is providing life changing medicine to communities across Ireland. To find out more, go to www.upmc.ie. So as I mentioned, Breed Stack is with us, the Cork player who won 11 all Ireland Senior Ladies Football Medals, 7 All-Star Awards and was the Player of the Year in 2016. Breed, thanks a lot for joining us. Hi, Fintan. How are you? Thanks for having me on. So we're going to talk today about the gamer moment that had a big impact in shaping your career. What have you gone for? <laughs> um, well, I suppose, look, thankfully, um, I had a lot of great moments um, throughout my career. Um, but I suppose probably one that stood out and one that maybe, um, I suppose, kind of cemented my position on, on, on that um, Cork team and cemented cement my position as centre-back was probably the 2007 um, All-Ireland Final um, versus Mayo. Um, so I suppose there was a fierce rivalry there for, for many, many years with Mayo. Um, we had gotten beaten by them in uh, three times, I think, in the 2004 um, over the over the sp- space of 2004 and I suppose we had met them in 2005 and had overcome them just by one point in a, a semi-final that propelled us to our first All-Ireland final um, but they were a mammoth side um, they had you know massive experience they had been in three of three of the four All-Ireland finals, I think, coming into 2005. So, you know, they had huge experience. Uh, a lot of those girls, I suppose, had four All-Ireland medals as well. Um, so, you know, it was a, a, a big task, I suppose, for a young Cork side. And um, I suppose coming into 2007 then, um, we met them in the league and we actually got beaten by them uh, in the league. They were the first team to kind of put a put a stop to us. Um, I think we had something like... Uh, I can't even remember now. Um, I think it was something like 31 successive wins um, over the space of uh, of 24 months, and um, they put a stop to us kind of in in um, the league semi final of 2007. And I suppose, look, you always know that you're going to get beaten at some stage. Um, and I suppose, looking back now, we were glad that it happened in that semi final. And um, we definitely uh, kept kept that reserve in our back pocket then when we met them in the All-Ireland final in 2007. So that's the match that I suppose stands out for me is the, the All-Ireland versus Mayo in 2007. Uh, okay, so, so I guess, you know, people will think of the Cork Ladies team and they'll probably just think of Dublin games because that's the ones recently. But th- this is the rivalry at the start of your career. Like they were the benchmark. And like when you made the breakthrough, you beat Galway in the 05 final, you beat Armagh in the 06 final. So was it kind of in the back of your heads, like, you know, this thing to, to kind of prove yourself and to, I suppose, be kind of really regarded? You had to be Mayo in a final. Definitely, yeah. Like, I suppose for the first couple of years when we were kind of getting our act together, we were getting um, beaten by Kerry and Watford, fantastic Kerry and Watford team. So Kerry, Watford, Mayo were the benchmark um, at that time. Um, and I suppose once you got out of Munster, if you did, you really, really, you know, were up against it if you came up against Mayo. Um, they had stalwarts all over their team, fantastic players. And I suppose, um, you know, they had just lethal forwards and a very, very, um, very, very balanced team. And like you say, I suppose we had gotten over a Galway team that came up from... Um, Intermediate the year before in 2005. We got an over an Arma team that had come up from intermediate as well, maybe the year before. So we were really coming up against stalwarts in 2007 um, against Mayo, a team that had been very, very well established. And I suppose ones that, like I said, had pipped us in the league final. Um, well, ha- sorry, actually hadn't pipped us, had beaten us by about six points, I think, in the league final in 2007. So we really, really needed to, to have a massive performance against them if we wanted to get across the line. The other thing about this time is that it's a time in Cork we're going for, I suppose, Camogie and Ladies Football All-Ireland win. So the Camogie had just lost the All-Ireland. What, what was that like for ye? Like, the, I suppose the pairs were only one code. Did that, was that a bit of an extra dimension 
going into a, a final and obviously it happened frequently whether they'd win or lost but did that kind of I don't know affect your preparation in any way when the, when those dual pairs kind of came back into the fold yeah like we would be very very we would have always been very invested in the camogie as well though I remember from the very first um year the 2005 uh when the girls actually the camogie girls won um, the all-ireland in 2005 as well um we went up um as a team and supported them in 2005 um we also, I suppose, use that um, to get a bit of a, a, a rub of the green as well in Crow Park. We, we kind of aim, and I don't know how he started to push that. We got a run around um, before our final then in two weeks um, after the Camogie. So we had we were always very, very invested in how the Camogie girls were doing. Um, I suppose, wanted to make sure that our girls were, were fine and injury free. Um, but we, we were very, very invested in them and we wanted to see them do well. And then I suppose in 2007, when they lost, we all had traveled up as well um, to support them. Um, and I suppose you really saw the hurt that was um, in the girls, you know, after when they came home from that um, match, they like there was a massive hurt in them, but then they just switched, you know, they were just ready to, I suppose, make make things right again um, for the football. And there was just a massive, massive drive, I suppose, in everyone to make sure that that didn't happen to us um, two weeks later. One of the better known dual players at the time was Mary O'Connor and she got ruled out through injury just before uh, this game. I mean, I was reading it, it like the, the line was that it was a freak incident in training and the extent of the injury, a cracked kneecap and suffered tendon and ligament damage. I mean, that just sounds like such a massive, obviously, personal setback for her. But I mean, that must have really kind of rocked your preparations in the, the build up to the All-Ireland final. Yeah, it was. Um, and actually, we had went on a training holiday um, to Malaga after the first round of Munster. Um, we had done it the year previous as well and it stood really well to us. So uh, Eamon and management decided that we would do it again in 2007 and we went to Malaga and actually Mary, uh, a pair of flip-flops nearly caused her undoing. She tripped on a step and fell and, and hurt her knee. Um, I think she had to get something like eight stitches over Malaga. So she actually missed a, a lot of the training, the training week. Um, and then as the year went on, she actually, yeah, like you say, she got injured in a challenge game uh, two weeks before the All-Ireland Final, which was an absolute massive blow. Um, again, her knee was on crutches for the All-Ireland Final, was absolutely devastated. And um, I suppose for us, you know, we were we were losing someone who would have been a real voice in our dressing room. Um, she was a real kind of level-headed, really calm person. And you knew that she would always do the right thing whenever she got the ball in her hand and was very encouraging of all those around her. Um, and then to go from maybe one of the older players on the, on the panel in steps Amanda Murphy for her um, on the All-Ireland final. Um, like Amanda, I can't even remember what age Amanda was. I'd say she probably couldn't have been more than maybe 17, 18. And it was just seamless. Um, so I think that was, you know, a real testament to our team and our panel. Um, there was great depth there. Eamon and management brought in, um, you know, really, really good underage players. And for a player like Amanda to step in, she was coolness personified. And it was just a case of, you know, this is my job. This is what I have to do. And although we lost Mary, you know, there was still such great balance in our team. And Amanda did a fantastic job. That, that's amazing. I mean, like you know better than anyone, you know, of how the pressure and the, the kind of nerves of all are in the final day. So for a teenager to come in, you know, I think she scored uh, three points from play and made yeah. a contribution. I mean, like, you know, so many players, big occasion kind of overawe them and, you know, they're, they're maybe taken off or it doesn't go well for them. But like she seems to have settled straight away. Yeah. And that, and that seemed to be a case for a lot of the younger players um, in our team down through the years. And it was a case of, you know, you were you were in you were in to do a job. And, you know, there wasn't, uh, uh, there wasn't time to be wasted. And I suppose people knew how strong the bench was. So if you didn't perform, you know, it was a case of, you know, you knew that you could get the curly finger as well, you know. So um, you had to do a job when you went in. So Amanda's playing at one end of the pitch. Let's talk about what's going on at the other side. Uh, so you start the game at centre-back. Uh, and I suppose maybe you would have been better known towards the end of your career as a full-back. Um, and Angela Walsh is kind of, I think, uh, playing just inside you. I mean, you mentioned earlier, I suppose, kind of Mayo stalwarts and all that, but look, one name stands out like it always has throughout her career in Cora Staunton. Tell us about uh, facing her that day. Yeah, so um, like I said, we got beaten by them in the league semi-final um, and then coming into championship, I think Cora had had an absolutely crazy championship. I think she had scored something like 344, I think, something like 344 in championship, like absolutely 
ridiculous stuff, you know. Um, she was their go-to forward. She was their key playmaker. Um, a lot of ball went through her. So we knew, I suppose, going into that All-Ireland final that we had to deny her. We had to deny her space. We had to deny her um, time. And we definitely had to de deny her um, free free taking opportunities. So I suppose as a defensive unit, um, we had had maybe two years kind of solidifying that defensive unit. It didn't change much, to be honest, over the course of eight, nine years. Um, but we knew, I suppose, that it was so important not to give away silly frees and just to cluster tackle any single time that Cora got the ball. Um, I suppose she did take on a lot the responsibility of the scoring herself. So we knew maybe if she got the ball that she might not be you know, I suppose, willing to give it away in that she trusted herself maybe um, to, to make sure uh, of every score. So we knew that we had to deny her the time, the space and the, and the free taking opportunities. So thankfully, we worked extremely well as a defensive unit and, and did that. And I suppose credit must go to the forwards as well, because the forwards worked like defenders. They tackled so, so hard that day and they made every ball, I suppose, that did come out of the Mayo defence, they made it you know, into nearly a 50-50 ball for us, which, you know, really stood to us then when we were trying to, to defend such a, a great side. This is probably not a straightforward question, but what, what makes Cora so good? Like, you've, you've marked her, you, like, a lot of us just watching from the stands, you know, she's been a long-serving player, like, she's still doing it now in Australia um, in, in the women's uh, Aussie rules game over there. Like, wh what is it about her that, that made her, makes her such a difficult opponent? Um, I suppose she has massive confidence in her abilities. That's number one. Um, and then she has fantastic skills to go with that. So, you know, when you pair those two together and they're a lethal combination, um, she really does back herself every single time. And I suppose as a forward, you probably need to have that confidence to, to make sure that you, you know, you, you take that chance and take that risk. Um, she has a fantastic burst of speed and she's, she's very, very, very strong on the ball. Um, so, as I said, her skill is fantastic. When she carries the ball, it's very, very hard to get, to get that tackle in. Um, and she keeps her center of gravity really low, which, which makes it very hard to defend. So she, she's, she's an excellent, like she's a very complete footballer, I would say in my, my mind. Like, you know, you could have her out on the 40 meter line and you think, gosh, oh, she'll, never, she'll never kick something from here and then she'll just make foolia, like, you know. So um, you have to make sure that you're touch tight at all times. And I suppose that day going into it, we knew that, that, that she was a massive, massive threat. Um, and I suppose in the build up to the match, no one knew who was going to be marking her. Um, it was just a case that our six um, backs were to work as a collective unit. Um, and then I suppose the night before I kind of got told um, that, that I was marking her, you know, so. So, so who, who tells you that? Is that management or is that a conversation you have in, amongst players that Eamon, Ryan, your legendary manager would kind of trust you to, to figure that out for yourselves? Uh, yes, yeah, so basically, I suppose for years on years, we always would have just lined out 15 on 15. There was no conversation ever had of who was picking up who. Um, but I suppose given how well she, Cora had done throughout um, the championship, and I suppose I was lining out against her, um, but there was still no talk of who was marking her. Um, there was a conversation the night before, I think, in the management. I only found all this out afterwards. And um, there, was a bit of, um, there was a bit of a battle of who would mark her. And um, it came down to I was playing centre-back all year. I had been playing well all year. And Mary Collins, I suppose, you know, thought that I should, I should start there. And then look, if, if I wasn't doing well there, that Rena should come on then and mark her. Rena is a fantastic man marker. So... Um, I suppose there was other members of management that thought maybe Rena should start on her and just not give, um, not give her any lead. So, um, look, it, I was voted in. I don't know if I was Eamon's choice or not, but um, in fairness to him, he came to my door that night at around 10 o'clock that night. And um, I suppose Mary Collins would have been my own club. She was our manager at the time. And maybe she knew my temperament. Maybe she knew that I needed to be told that the night before to kind of have it clear in my head. And uh, Eamon, although maybe he didn't vote for me, um, you know, he came to my door the night before and he just knocked on the door and just said, look, you're marking Cora. Good night. Go to sleep. And uh, I just said, grand job. Thanks. And I actually slept sounder, I think, that night, knowing that I was going marking her. And that was my job that I had to do the day after. But it wasn't it definitely wasn't just me. It was a collective unit. And I suppose the trust that we had in each other. I knew that if Cora went past me, that there was another two, three girls that were just going to make her job very, very difficult. And there was a massive trust there in that back line. 
it's a, a short and straight to the point chat. So when uh, Eamon's kind of telling you who you're marking. Straight in, bang, bang, that's it. Yeah, close the door, go to bed. Yeah. Did, did you as a defender enjoy uh, taking on the, the best forwards? Was, was that the kind of a thing that you relished uh, throughout your career? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely love that. Um, and I suppose I still love being given a job kind of even, you know, to, to this day, like, you know, um, as I would have started out as a centre-back, definitely. And centre-back would definitely be my preferred position. I absolutely loved it. Um, Angela would have always played inside me then in the full back role and I suppose then as the years went on um, I was given a few man marking roles um, so I was played in corner for or corner back um, and then I suppose when Angela stepped away maybe we had a bit of a, a, a massive void to try to fill there and um, I was trusted with going in full back then so I had to really learn a completely new um, new role really because centre back and full back are are such different um, positions. Fullback is such a specialised position, and uh, it took me maybe a couple of years to to get into the role. But um, I found my feet with it eventually towards the end. You know, so. Well, the the game itself couldn't have gone better. Uh, obviously, the fact that you won, but like individually, I think you ended up with the Player of the Match award. Um, and like it seems like a game that you know you won. The final score was two eleven to two six, but like they got a goal at the very end, so you always seem to have a, a fair bit of a cushion. Uh, Valerie Mulcahy, I think, hit, hit two goals. So like it all this talk beforehand about kind of marking a particular player but the day itself it, it goes very well for you yeah and I think Eamon actually kind of said beforehand you know while Cora is fantastic she's just one player I think there was something like 30 um All-Ireland um, medals in that Mayo panel you know going into that 2007 game so you know we had to beat the team we didn't have to beat just one person we had to beat the team and that day we went in like I don't know we were just ravenous for the ball you know um we needed a complete team performance and we got and we did that from start to finish and uh, i think with only a couple of minutes left on the clock we were up 12 12 points and they got two late goals i suppose to to kind of cushion the blow a small bit but we were on top of them from start to finish and as i said our forwards worked so hard defending and our backs were just tigerish in in, in the tackle you know and it was just the I think in 2007, it stands out as being one of my favourite games because there was such a complete performance by everyone and everything just went right for us on the day. You've talked about how much it kind of meant to you to, to beat me on a final, but it's interesting, you never actually played them in a final after that. It was mainly Dublin and I think you had three uh, final wins over Monaghan as well. So this was the only chance and occasion you had to win a final against a team that you had looked on as the benchmark at the time. Yeah, definitely. Um, and like by no means were they coming to an end in 2007. You know, they, they, were, they were still very, very much to the front um, in the years that followed. But we just never met them in a final. Um, maybe it was just the way that the kind of the, the pairings laid out. Um, but, you know, that, that 2007 final, as I said, was it was so important for us to have such a complete performance because of who we were up against. And I just think Mayo were such a fantastic side that if they did get to a final, they could, you know, they could absolutely blitz you. And maybe we caught them a couple of times in semifinals and things like that when maybe they weren't at, at, the, at their best, you know. So um, it, was a, it, was a love, it was a sweet one. It definitely was, yeah. For you individually, was this the sort of experience that always gives you confidence and it's always kind of maybe a game that you can kind of go back to in your mind throughout the rest of your career? It, it's, it's just, uh, I suppose, the type of a challenge that you overcome and it kind of does a lot for your self-belief in your game. Yeah, um, I suppose I would definitely be a confidence player. Um, like I, I would need to make sure that I'm always at my fittest um, during championship. Um, like um, I suppose in 2007, when I did get a player of the match in that all Ireland final, it does give you a massive boost, I suppose. And going into 2008, you want to try to replicate those type of performances year on year on year. So it definitely keeps you striving to get the best out of yourself. Um, and as I said, maybe it does give you that little bit of confidence um, going into to games saying, well, look, I, I've marked this player. I've done well on this player. You know, I can, I can do well here again today. Um, so, yeah, definitely it's, it's those small things I suppose you take in. But it's just trying to replicate good performances every single time. And, and it doesn't happen every single time. And Eamon Ryan, I suppose, used to always say to us, you're only as good as your last game. And whether that was a poor game or a good game, you know, if it was a good game, you're always trying to replicate that good game. Um, so, yeah, I suppose they're, they're good memories to have. Just finally, what did it do for you as a team 
could be in the three in a row. I mean, obviously, the, like the profile of the 80s football has exploded ever since with the television coverage and kind of increased profile and bigger fans at games. But like at this time, you'd only made the breakthrough in 2005. But then you gone on and done three in a row, and, and for whatever reason, it just it's always kind of struck me as the three in a row is a big thing in in, in GA at kind of any level. It was was it a very kind of I suppose a nice thing for your team to to reflect on and a nice achievement. Yeah, it was, and definitely because Eamon was so grounded, there was never any any talk of three in a row during the year. But when you achieve it, um, I think the Kerry ladies were the only team to have ever done it in the history of ladies football. Um, I think Mayo had fallen at the final hurdle with it. Um, and for us, I suppose, to get over the line, it was lovely to, I suppose, put your name in the history books. Um, but then you're never just happy with just that, you know. You want to strive for more. You want to strive for more every single time. And I think we went on and we won a five in a row um, and then had a little blip in 2010, all right, and then secured another five in a row. Like, it was, it was phenomenal thinking back what that team had achieved. And I suppose I know now looking back, that it really was such a great team. You know, there are good teams, but I really, I really feel so fortunate that I was part of such a great team. Um, and I suppose maybe it didn't come until 2014 when we had that massive comeback that people really, really, you know, took heed of, of how great a team it was. And for us to get, a, I suppose, team of the year by public vote um, was, was absolutely fantastic that year. Um, so, yeah, like... I suppose ladies football has definitely come a long, long way in a couple of, of, of short years. And it's lovely to know that you are at the start of maybe propelling that forward as a team. Yeah, well, I think there's no disputing the greatness of that course side now when we look back. And the game we've been talking about today, the 2007 final win over Mayo, was certainly an example of that. Uh, this has been the 42's Life Changing Moments podcast series with UPMC, the official healthcare partner of the GPA and GAA. Breed Sack, our guest today. Thanks very much for your time and talking to us. Thank you.